Hey everybody, welcome to chapter two PFL test review. Today we're gonna go over vocab. This will be one of several test review videos that you'll see. Let's go ahead and get started. First thing I wanna mention is that even though I'm covering particular vocab words in this video, that does not mean that these are the only vocab words that are gonna be on the test. It's very possible that there are other vocab words uh, that have been covered either in your workbook or through videos or through discussions, but if you start here, this is a great starting point. First word we're gonna begin with is going to be commodities. And commodities we've described in class uh, to make it a little bit easier uh, to say that they are things that we can see, we can fill them, we can touch them, and that makes it a little bit easier to understand when we compare a commodities investment to, say, a Roth IRA or a 401k. Roth IRAs, 401ks, difficult to see, touch, feel, um, but commodities we can. And some of the examples that we've gone through have been gold, we've talked about wheat, oil, and those types of things. Now, one of the things I want to just make sure that we make a distinction between is commodities and the word futures. And oftentimes students will kind of combine them and, and while they do kind of go together in some degrees, they really are two, uh, two words. And futures really means just what it sounds like in the future. And so when we tie commodities to futures, we are predicting oftentimes the price of gold, for example, into the future. And we would say that this is probably a risky way to invest in particular when we start getting into stuff like wheat and those types of things because really wheat is um, dependent on nature, mother nature and drought and floods and weather and those types of things. So commodities, see, feel, touch, um, gold, wheat and oil are some things uh, are examples and we sometimes will tie them to futures. We'll kind of put this into the category of at least at your level, um, do not invest in and uh, you know, maybe when you get a little bit more skilled, um, somebody might tell you that this is an option for you. But as of right now, for our basic level, um, commodities are gonna be kind of a, a no-no for, for investing. Next up, we are going to talk about track record. And you know, track record is kind of an interesting thing when it comes to investing because first thing you should know about a track record is just because it's done well in the past does not mean that it's going to do well in the future. It's not a guarantee. However, it's kind of all we have to go on, or at least one of the factors. I think it's probably incorrect to say all that we have to go on, but it's one of the factors that we have to go on. So let's correct that and just say that it is a factor to consider when we're deciding whether or not we want to invest in something. We're really talking probably about a five to 10 year track record. Um, obviously there's mutual funds that have a longer track record than five to 10 years, but five to 10 years really is kind of at least what we're looking for. And for test purposes, five to 10 years is probably going to be one of your options and probably the best option. So consider that. But we just kind of want to know what this fund is all about, where it's been, how it's performed, what's going on. You know, we use this silly uh, analogy in class about, um, you know, if, you, if you're uh, dating somebody, you would like to know if, if they've been nice or a jerk to people that they've dated before. It would be good information to have. Um, and that was kind of a silly example, but same thing with our mutual funds. We want to have some idea of what they've done in the past. Moving on, uh, we really want to know the difference between savings and investing. A and a little hint here, there's probably at least, oh, seven, eight questions, savings versus investing. And at the very basic level, the definition is savings is for five years or less. And investing, Investing, of course, then would be for five years or more. Now, you can see that right here with my example, they both kind of combine at five years. I'm not gonna give you a trick question about five years exactly, so don't worry about that. But the reason that we separate these two is that we're gonna put them into different places. If we're saving, we're going to probably put this into a money market or some sort of savings account. And if we're investing, 
we're probably going to choose some sort of mutual fund. So those are kind of the two things you need to know about savings and investing. Savings is five years or less, investing is five years or more. And you know we put them in a different place too. Savings goes into a money market. Primarily, the main reason for that, guys, is because we're probably gonna need it. Uh, we've already defined it as needing it between now and five years, so we wanna put it into a place like a money market where we can access it, where we can get to it within five years. Because if we start to put stuff into mutual funds, although we can get to it, um, sometimes there's fees and penalties, and it's just a little bit messier. So um, we would put money that we need, like savings money, into a money market. Stuff we don't need, stuff for retirement, we're gonna put into a mutual fund. So those are the two things, really. Uh, the difference in time and where we put those types of um, savings and investments. This word is all over the test. We talked about this, liquidity. And liquidity, the definition of liquidity is how easy your money is to access. Hopefully you can see this color. Let me know in the comments if you can't. Um, but you know we've talked about several different examples with this, and, and one example that we've used is the, the cookie jar, or maybe we're talking about our pocket. And if the money is in our pocket, it is very liquid. We can, if somebody were to come into the room and, and we owed them five dollars and we had a five dollar bill in our pocket, we could give them five dollars immediately, right then. That's very liquid. Well, the opposite is true when we start talking about other types of investments. Let's say we talk about real estate. And, you know, ask your parents, uh, if you were to sell, if you decided today, if you wanted to sell your house, how quickly they think that you could actually get the money for the house. And, and most people who have sold houses would know that this is not a quick turnaround. Real estate, you know, takes into consideration or you have to take into consideration, uh, you know, a week uh, to get a realtor involved and pictures and it up on uh, the realtor's website and then people have to come and visit and once they visit then there's some negotiation back and forth on price and then they have to do all kinds of paperwork and so, you know, really uh, it, it takes uh, at the very, very easiest or quickest months. I should probably say weeks, and and you know after that uh, it could take months uh, to sell. So we're talking probably you know at least a month, probably more, and several months. Uh, you know if you're pretty lucky for liquidity in real estate. So um, you know there's kind of a continuum. So we'll we'll take this, and if this is very liquid over here, then this would be cash in your pocket. And if this is not liquid on this side then this might be real estate over here. And, and obviously there's stuff in the middle, um, mutual fund, money market, those types of things. But liquidity is how easy it can to get, how easy it is to get your money. And there may be some examples of that on the test. One of the words that we've used um, several times has been international. And for our purposes, international is going to be anything that is not the United States. In particular, any companies that are not US companies. So we definitely have talked about the total stock market. We've definitely talked about um, owning that as one of our primary uh, mutual funds, but in the total stock market, that example, those are all U.S. companies. And sometimes in order to increase our diversification and spread out a little bit more, we'll want to bring in some international companies. So that's a, a term that you should probably know as well. Bonds. Bonds are something that, if you notice with Dave's workbook, you know, he doesn't really even recommend bonds, but you know, we're going to talk about bonds a little bit as kind of a balancer. They kind of balance your stocks. Um, they, they can, for several reasons, uh, be slightly less risky. And so some people who are nervous or, or don't want uh, to see all of their money go down when the stock market comes down, they will oftentimes purchase bonds. And you know, stocks and bonds don't always kind of go down at the same time, and they don't always go up at the same time. And so there's a little bit of a balance there. But really what you should know for this, for test purposes, is, is this is a debt instrument, meaning 
If you buy a bond, you are loaning somebody money and they will agree to pay you back plus interest in a certain amount of time. So it's, it's really a way in which companies borrow money to grow their business and people who loan them that money will get that money paid back plus interest. And that's what makes it an investment for those people who loan the money. They get their money back plus some. There's not too many questions about bonds to be honest, but what I have up here on the board should, should get you by. All right, risk return ratio. There are several questions about risk return ratio. And, and basically, we are tying this word, risk, with return. That, that's kind of what we're thinking about. So if I, if I go up like this, as I, if this is risk right here, and this is low risk, and this is a high risk over here, as my risk goes up, I'm hoping that my return also goes up. Because why would you risk that much if you're not going to get something in return? And the, the opposite's also true. If, if I have a low risk, my return, I should expect, should be pretty low. So high risk, hopefully high return. Low risk, probably not much of a return. And some of the examples we use over here if we're talking about really low risk, and we're saying that we're gonna put our money underneath the, um, the bed, underneath the mattress, you know, that's pretty low risk. Uh, nobody, you know, hopefully will steal it, and your return's gonna be zero, though. And you're actually gonna be losing money when you factor in inflation. Um, and then we can kind of move down, maybe, maybe if we put a money market, a little bit more risk, but, and a little bit more return, then maybe we're talking about uh, CDs, and we're talking about mutual funds, and we're talking about, um, you know, lottery tickets, we said, and going to Vegas, and, and, and day trading, and some of the craziness up here, which is simply too much risk for the return. So we want to find a spot where you know there's there's kind of a decent amount of risk so that we're going to uh, get some return but not too much risk where we where we lose everything because we still want to be diversified. So risk return ratio for the test basically is um, you know as your risk goes up you hope your return goes up. Almost done with these. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about annuities. Um, annuities, there's not too much on the test. Don't stress about annuities. Um, for our, we're going to make this very simple for our class. Uh, they're, they're a little bit more complicated than this. You should know that they're basically kind of a fancy savings account, not with a bank, but with an insurance company. So that's the first thing. Uh, and, and really, you know, we could go into more details, but uh, we won't for the class uh, that we're taking right now. Uh, we should also put um, here that there's a couple kinds. There's a fixed and there's a variable. Dave has said, really, this isn't a great investment to have. And so, um, you know, he, he's saying for sure don't do the fixed. If you have to do something or if you have the opportunity to do something, you know, variable might be the one that you might want to do. But annuities, kind of from where we're standing, this is a very simple. Um, perspective because this is a beginning level personal finance class but this is kind of a, a do not at least right now um, you really can do your Roth or your 401k depending on what's available there um, before you do this last ones we want to cover are mutual funds and mutual funds are where people pool their money together and they buy a collection of companies. Now, this collection of companies really can have a lot. We noticed with the total stock market that you know we had what in the in the total stock market, three thousand four hundred and ninety nine different companies in there. That that's quite a bit, and so that really helps us to spread out or diversify. So diversify, spread out. That's a key word that we're going to be talking about on the test and uh, mutual funds really allow us to do it. Uh, on the test, we're probably gonna talk somewhere between nine, 90 and 200 different um, companies in an average mutual, mutual fund. 
Now, obviously, we've already seen some examples where that number is higher, but there's also numbers where it's lower, where you know there might only be a handful of, of companies in a particular mutual fund. But our average mutual fund, we're going to say for test purposes, 90 to 200. We do mutual funds because it allows us to diversify. It also allows us to pool our money together to purchase things that we may not be able to purchase by ourselves. You know, there's no way that I'm going to be able to go out and buy 3,499 stocks all by myself. But if I pull it together um, and I have a company or an organization like Vanguard or something like that that allows me to or helps me to kind of organize it, I can do it. So that's kind of where we're at with the vocab. Um, this video went a little bit longer than I planned. It's about 15 minutes as it sits right now. Uh, I think it'll give you a great um, starting point, and if you understand those terms and the way that we described them, you probably will have a, a pretty good head start uh, on the test. So um, you've learned a lot. We've talked a lot about this stuff. You know more than you probably think. Uh, I don't want you to go in being nervous. Um, have some confidence, and uh, you should do pretty well. Thanks for joining me.